Hello, BookTube. You know, over the years, I've made no secret of the fact that when it comes to this little corner of BookTube, I very much view these videos as part of a community. I know that sounds really hackneyed, but I honestly think it's true. And I've made enough real-world friends in this community to kind of feel that I could justify that belief. When I watch a video that's in my queue for the day, I don't think I'm signing up for whatever the latest episode of whatever show so-and-so is putting on. I do think that about the larger environs of BookTube and about, you know, the wilds of YouTube in general, but not this little community. I think instead that I am sitting down to visit with someone. What's on their mind? What, what bad joke they want to try out? What thing are they bringing to my attention? That sort of thing. Uh, it makes this little corner of BookTube an unparalleled experience for me, something that the like of which I have never had before. I have a find a hard time describing it to people who don't know what it is. I have a hard time describing its wonders. I am addicted to those wonders. I keep coming back for that. Uh, but one natural side consequence of that is that sometimes we disagree with our friends. Yes, <laughs> sometimes we do. Sometimes you're, uh, a friend will say something and you don't agree with it at all. And in normal parlance, the response to that would be, uh, to tell them that, <laughs> to, to, to take them aside and tell them that, or if it's said directly to you, respond in kind. But, and that is possible with this little corner of book too, but the videos go out to everybody, right? So even though they're made by friends, if I disagree with them, I feel like I should disagree to everybody as well. <laughs> so that's the most justification that I'm going to give for what boils down to a South Boston Irish Catholic love of a good scrap. <laughs> and I saw three videos recently that I loved, these are from booktubers that I really like, but I disagreed with things in each of those videos. So I thought I would go through those three things as sort of a public rebuttal. <laughs> and I will leave links to all of the offending videos down below. And the first one, of course, is Brian at Bookish, my arch nemesis, my bet noir, my eyebrow baby, <laughs> uh, who made a video uh, on his channel in which, that starts out really promising. It, it was a a random stream of consciousness thing, different from his Saturday hodgepodge, but not that different. It was it was old man bookish sitting down at his camera and just sort of rambling about what's on his mind. And it started off promisingly enough. Uh, Brian was, for the whole of his career, a teacher of history to students in, in high school and in college. So he was talking about the changing standards in teaching history. And his video started off really good by... Uh, championing the knocking of uh, founding fathers off their thoughtless, brainless veneration pedestals. I have been calling for that for a long, long time. <laughs> for a long time, I have been saying, we shouldn't venerate these people because half of them own slaves. <laughs> That's not venerating. But there's no way to venerate that. There's no way to, to use that as an asterisk and say, well, you know, he was a, for, a profound Enlightenment era thinker in the American scene. But he also owned people as property and raped that property and beat that property in the face and branded children with a hot iron himself. Okay? No blunting of responsibility by putting it in the hands of a vicious overseer, doing it himself. Uh, and that calls for maybe a, an extreme qualification of veneration. Uh, so Brian's video started off fine like that. But he had a goal in mind, as he always does. He had a goal of the wokeism. Uh, and he moved on to that and said, you know, if we're changing the standards by which, for instance, uh, literary prizes judge their long lists, or the way, for instance, colonial era or post-colonial era American history is taught uh, in regards to slavery and the slave trade, for instance, that sort of thing, that all of that is, it's not an attack on anybody, it, it's, and it's not woke ideology. Instead, it's just changing standards. It's a changing uh, standard of the way people are, va are valuing these things, the way they're judging them. And I was okay with a part of that, except when it comes to literary prizes, which of course is my bread and butter. That's my literary world is my world. It's where I live. Uh, and Brian had in mind, I think, the Booker Prize. The Booker Prize long list was just announced. He might also have been glancing at the Penn Faulkner list, which is, to my mind, the perfect illustration of what is wrong with this subject. Uh, now, 
Brian is from Texas, <laughs> so he has a stubborn streak in him. I don't think he is ready to admit that when he's wrong. Uh, and he's definitely wrong on this subject because he was talking about this in terms of these changing standards in terms of literary prizes and mentioned that that's all that is, is that th these prizes used to go predominantly to straight white men, and now they are more diverse. They are broader. So we're looking for excellence everywhere here, not just with straight light, white men. Now, he, even then, the sailing was smooth, because I want these prizes to look as broadly as possible for great stuff. Uh, even then, we were, we were relatively smooth sailing, even though he conspicuously did not mention the for great stuff part. But then, we hit rocky waters because he said that... Uh, Back then, in the bad old days, your grandparents were terrible people. Uh, all of the positions of power in the publishing world were held by straight white men. And so naturally, it reflected, they were reflected in the fact that that's, that that's where they gave the awards, because of that we, they weren't really literary people, they were terrible people, and they myopically looked only at their own tribe for who could win prizes. Uh, the prize-winning record for most prizes in the English-speaking world wouldn't bear that out, but... I can see it as a line of reasoning. The, the, the first place where we hit choppy water was when Brian just sort of offhandedly said that most positions of authority in the publishing world are still held by cis, uh, cis white men. That is flagrantly, flagrantly incorrect. It's cartoonishly wrong. There are barely any men in publishing anymore. No, no editor, no commissioning editor, no agent, certainly. No one up the food chain, barely anybody except the old relic at the very top is a man. Uh, and that's been true for a long time. Uh, it hasn't reached the point quite yet where if Farrar, Stars, and Giroux has an opening for an intern, they will simply say, if you're a man, please don't apply. It hasn't quite reached that point yet, but it's not far off. And there won't be any major objections when it happens. That will certainly happen, and when it does. Uh, <laughs> that was choppy water, but I'm accustomed to that. People still think, they still, especially people who are, who are a little bit enthralled to uh, woke scoldism, they will, uh, they're still enthralled to the idea of a world that is just routinely, blithely dominated by fat, cis, white, old men who not only don't hire women, but slap them casually on the sidewalk. What's the police going to do? <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. Most administrative states, most colleges, most hospitals, most schools, most city institutions, most bookstores, most aspects of publishing, they're all run by women. Uh, but woke sculpts tend to love that image, that, that we are fighting for the very lives of people, that, that white men are wandering onto buses and just booting people off. <laughs> Granted, it's disaffected, crazy young white men who are mass murderers in this country, who are mass shooters. But those, they're nuts. And the broad brush of society has long ago left that model behind, but it doesn't matter. It's too useful for woke scolds, and I'm accustomed to rough water when it comes to enjoying Brian's videos. I very much enjoy his videos, but we don't see eye to eye on everything. <laughs> Not at all. But then he finished up by saying that that's all it is with book prizes, with choosing recipients, long-listed members of book prizes, is just changing standards. That's all it is, is just where it's more diverse, that's all. I am sure that folded parenthetically into his discussion of that was some idea of more diverse search for quality literature, but he doesn't actually say it, and I don't think uh, it bears omitting, because it isn't there. When I was watching that video, I kept wanting to say, what if diversity is the new agenda? Not literary quality, but diversity mindless diversity, checkbox diversity. What if that is the new agenda and it has nothing to do with literary quality? Nothing at all. Would you still be okay with it? Is it that important? That is diversity that important that you can have a perfectly great novel sitting right there, but the author doesn't check a box for you that has nothing to do with literature? Do you really want major awards that are done by that standard? I'm not saying that we shouldn't broaden the diversity of looking for candidates, but the yardstick should be the same, which is the excellence of what they do. It shouldn't be, well, yeah, this is largely garbage. Last year's Booker, I won't go into specifics, but it's, it shouldn't be, yeah, this is largely garbage, but the author is from Trinidad. 
That shouldn't matter. Now, I know the, the standard woke scold response, I'm not saying this will be Brian's response, because sometimes his, stand, his responses are not standard woke scold. <laughs> the standard woke scold response would be, well, you know, you're a product of institutional white privilege racism. So, of course, you're going to say that you have, you have a knowledge of what that quality is, and it might be different. For, not, for, people, for people who don't come from your long, long line of uninterrupted slave-owning privilege. <laughs> and, of course, I disagree with that. Of course I do. I disagree with the whole notion of uh, blood guilt or inherited guilt of any kind. That is an Old Testament religious belief. It doesn't have any uh, real-world validity to it. It's just a, a means for vengeance. It's just a means for vengeance. And so I don't agree with that. And that was a question I wanted to ask to... Brian in that video is, what if mindless diversity with no thought to literary quality is the new standard? Would you still like it? You're right to point out very holistically, very humanistically, you're right to point out that standards change and we should all be, we should all be interested in that and largely okay with it. We don't want our standards to, to stay the same, but some standards are bad, <laughs> right? Some new standards are bad, was the point that I wanted to make there. Not so much of a disagreement as an elaboration. Uh, then the next victim here, the next channel, is Matt Wall at Paperback Junkie, another channel I love. Uh, and uh, he did a video, again, I'll leave a link to all of this before, and he did a video responding to a few videos that came out, one of whom was, one of which was by me, on how to book two, how to do this right here. A few do's and a few don'ts on how to do this. Uh, and... Uh, true to his free-spirited nature, Matt said, do the effing, do what you effing want. It's your effing channel. There's no effing right or effing wrong uh, way to do it. Uh, and, again, I want, to, I want to politely disagree. That is not true. In my own video, for instance, on tips about booktubing, the things that I was saying are wrong to do, I think would generally be considered wrong to do. Most of the things that I was saying were wrong to do are rude to do. And do whatever the heck you want can't be the way that we act as adults. It can't be. Obviously, it can't be. You can't do whatever you want. It's not good to be rude to people. If you want to be rude to people, then that's a bad thing. You should not want to do that. And even if you want to do that, you should be discouraged from doing that. And you know, starting a video where for the first five minutes you're chewing food, you're barely understandable because your mouth is full, and then when you're done and you swallow the food very audibly, then you make a, a big pronounced point out of a long belch. Ah, okay, now, where were we? Where we were is I'm not watching and I'm unsubscribing. That's where we were, because that's incredibly rude to do. And likewise, on a lesser note, maybe a less conscious note, the people who do that are always doing it to make a point that they don't value your attention at all. But this means nothing to me. What I'm doing right now, I hit record, but what I'm doing means nothing to me. You mean nothing to me. A lesser version of that would be if you just fumble into your video without having any idea what you're talking about. That might not be as consciously rude, but it's still a waste of your viewer's time. And wasting your viewer's time or being rude to them is not covered by do whatever you want. I understand the point that Matt was making. There is no regimen here. Right? Make your own channel. And Matt even mentions at one point in his video that you can either grow your channel or you can destroy your channel. It's up to you. And I think the implication there was that if you do a whole bunch of things bad, a whole bunch of wrong things, you will destroy your channel. You can still do it. You're still free to do it. Well, I agree. You are free to do it. But who makes a channel in order to have everyone hate it? Uh, who does that? I would argue, I would, again, enhance what Matt was saying in his video by saying, it's not quite just a blanket, do whatever the F you want. It's not quite that, because you're making something. And there are good and bad ways to make something, uh, which brings us uh, to uh, number three, <laughs> which is Matthew, Michael K. Vaughn, uh, who made a video about Garb August. He did his version of the Garb August trashy book tag. Now, this is about an event that is just about to come. You have one free weekend where your life is as it was before, <laughs> in the before times. And then suddenly Garb August is upon you. That is a month-long event created by Criminali, as if that needs saying. Celebrating garbage, celebrating trash books for the whole month of August. Uh, and that's coming right up. 
and so everybody, uh, the hosts of Garbagas are trying to do the Garbagas trash tag. A whole bunch of people are, are uh, contemplating TBR videos and whatnot for the trash they'll be reading in August. And Michael K. Vaughn is one of the hosts. And uh, as you know, if you watch his channel, he has, much as I do, much as Ollie does, although not to Ollie's extent, a pretty pronounced taste for trash. He likes his trash when he finds it. Uh, and he did a version of the Garbagas trash tag. And it was great. I'll leave a link to it down below. But he opened it with a comment that I cannot let pass. I cannot let it go. It was a public comment. I don't want anyone thinking that the hosts of Garbagas are in uniform agreement on this on this point. Before he gets to the, the details of the tag, he says that really only two kinds of book are actually trash. Self-help books and political books. Because in both cases, they're pretty much consciously lying to you. And he says in the opening of his video that aside from those categories of books, yeah, there's no really such thing as trash. And I'm not picking on Michael alone because he is echoing a sentiment that I see coming to the fore in Garb August. And it's that sentiment. That aside from a few handful of books that are trying to lie to you, there isn't any such thing as trash. And that isn't true. That absolutely isn't true. That is That necessitates a response on my part from the side of critics. I hate to put it that way, though, because it's not just critics. It, it's not just critics who think that books are the are not the only thing in the world that can't be assessed objectively. Plenty of people think that, because it's true. <laughs> and to say that the only kinds of books are, that are trash are lying self-help books or lying political books is to say that no piece of fiction, for instance, can be trash. And that isn't true. If something is done poorly by its own lights, by its own standards, by its own schedule, then it's trash. If something is done ineptly, it's garbage. <laughs> if it's not a good example of what it is trying to be, unless what it's trying to be is garbage, but most of them aren't, most, most writers of garbage did not think they were writing garbage, unless it's trying to be garbage, if it's trying to be something else and failing, I mean, Michael K. Vaughn knows as well as I do that there are certainly whole libraries worth of garbage history books, for instance. Is he going to say that, that Bill O'Reilly's ghostwritten Killing the Mob is not garbage? Of course he's not. He's going to say it's terrible. Well, that's because there's a spectrum of objectively judging these things. And it's, it's not just that you look at some crappy piece of, you know, uh, Cleopatra, what Cleopatra farted at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> or, or some, you know, hasn't the world gone to shite in a handbasket or something like that. You look at a book like that, or the books that we're going to be seeing in Garb August, the very worst response, the, the response that not only isn't true, but totally invalidates Garb August itself, is to look at all those things and say, well, there's no real garbage here. Saying that there's no real books, that no books are really garbage, is first cousin once removed from saying, yeah, it's all subjective. And that isn't true. <laughs> Michael K. Vaughan knows that. Everyone in Garb August knows that. That isn't true. It isn't all subjective. So, in addition, I agree with him completely that self-help books and political books are all lying. And they and they're very much merit the term trash because of that. Michael, unlike Michael K. Vaughan, I have read Peter Navarro's book, who went on Ari Melber's show and detailedly confessed to plotting a coup to overthrow the United States government. He's still got a book contract. He's still got a book published. It's coming out next month, and I've read it. If it's not trash, I don't know what is. It's a political book, though. That umbrella is too narrow. That is not, I agree, it's trash, and political books are, but plenty of other books are. Plenty. Let's not go into Garbagas saying it's all relative. Let's not go into Garbagas saying the only people who say X, Y, or Z novel is trash are those snooty critics with one pinky in the ear. Let's not do that. And when I was watching his video, before I hunkered down to enjoy his version of the tag, I was seeing red because he was, he was saying there's no trash. That nothing is really trash. So there you go. Those are three polite disagreements with three booktubers. These things happen. It doesn't dent friendships at all. It doesn't cause blood vendettas <laughs> in the slightest. I just disagreed with them, and since the videos are made for all and sundry to listen to, I thought I would make my disagreements for all and sundry to listen to. A voice of opposition crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. In this case, as in all cases, the Lord being so there you go, book two. A little contention for your boiling hot Friday. I'm going to wrap this up 
Uh, but I'll be back with more peaceful videos tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.